This is Neef Talks. Northeast Astronomy Forum presents Eight-time Emmy-nominated meteorologist, Joe Rayo. His topic, a new meteor shower for May. Now over to you, Joe. Good day, everybody. My name is Joe Rayo, and I'm here to tell all of you today about what could be a very special astronomical event that is coming up at the end of May of this year of 2022. I prepared a PowerPoint lecture about this, so let's get started. Let me first share my screen, and then we'll get right on into this. Now, what this is, is based upon a feature article which I wrote for the May edition of Sky and Telescope magazine. And it deals with the po potential of a new meteor shower. And uh, this shower is being caused by a, a comet which broke apart into several pieces back in 1995. The two gentlemen who discovered this comet back in 1930, on the left you see Arno Schwachmann, and on the right you see Arnold Wachmann. And comet schwachmann wachmann was actually the third of four comets that this duo discovered on uh, the uh, 2nd of May back in 1930, 92 years ago. And the announcement initially was that this comet on the 31st of May of 1930 would pass very close to us, less than 6 million miles away. Now, when a comet passes that close to us, there's usually a surge of excitement because comets passing that close usually means something rather spectacular or at least something interesting to see in the sky. You may remember if you're an old timer in astronomy that back in 1983, we had a comet named Iris Araki Alcock, which came within less than 3 million miles of the Earth. And for a few nights, it whizzed across the sky, even reaching a point where it was brighter than the North Star, at least magnitude two. This was a very interesting comet to watch. It was not spectacular, but interesting to see with the unaided eye and with good binoculars and telescopes as it uh, crossed through the heavens. Then in 1996, we had comet Yakutake. Yakutake didn't come quite as close as Iris Araki Alcock, but it came within 9 million miles of the Earth, and it provided us with a rather spectacular show. The head of the comet was of zero magnitude, and the tail, well, that the tail, depending upon how dark your skies were, stretched across the sky for anywhere from 40 to maybe as much as 80 degrees. An amazing sight. And here's a picture that was taken from 29th Street and Avenue of the Americas in Midtown Manhattan. This is a view of the Empire State Building at two o'clock in the morning. And look right next to it is that fuzzy patch of light that was Comet Yakutake, bright enough to be seen even from the light polluted streets and avenues of Midtown Manhattan, amazing. Any case, we were hoping, or at least the astronomers back in 1930 were hoping for a show from Comet Schwachmann Wachmann 3. I'm, from here on, I'm gonna call it SW3 um, instead of using the full uh, name or moniker. But the reason that we didn't see much of SW3 in 1930 was it's a rather small comet. In fact, it was only about one mile or so in diameter. And because of that, it uh, really didn't show very well against the sky. In fact, it got no brighter than magnitude seven, and it was visible only with good binoculars or uh, especially good telescopes. Still, a comet is a comet, and a comet coming as close as uh, almost uh, six billion miles from the Earth uh, did get, garner some attention. Here's a view of the largest refracting telescope in the world, still holds that title, the Yerkes Observatory Telescope, out in Wisconsin. And one gentleman who was on the staff back at that time was a gentleman by the name of George Van Beesbrook. He was uh, an immigrant from Belgium and uh, was very interested in the small bodies of the solar system, meteoroids, asteroids, and especially comets. So George Van Beesbrook, or Van B as he was known to his friends, took a look at the comet Comet SW3 as it passed on by in May of 1930. He observed it visually, took photographs of it. There you see a couple of weeks before the closest approach, uh, the comet just spanned about two thirds the size, the apparent size of a full moon, approximately 20 um, uh, arc minutes across. And on the night when the comet passed closest, looking at it through the big Yerkes telescope visually, 
uh, Van B noted that the nucleus of the comet looked like the well, kind of like an elliptical galaxy edge on or a spindle shaped object. This might've been the very first time that anyone ever actually saw directly the nucleus of a comet. After 1930 though, the comet was missing in action. As you see here, these are the assumed dates of when the comet came closest to the earth, but we never saw it in any of these years, partially because it was a very small, dim, intrinsically faint comet, and also because we never really were able to get a good handle on the orbit of the comet. The comet's orbit was always changing. So it was, it was invisible or wasn't seen from uh, 1935 to 1974. We briefly saw it again in 1979, but it was missing again in 1985. And the reason was that uh, this big guy, Jupiter, was constantly tugging on that comet. The comet takes about five and a half years to go around the sun. And because of Jupiter's gravitational pull, every now and then, the pull of Jupiter would pull the comet a little bit off course from its prior orbit. And so, uh, it, because the orbit was constantly changing, we never really were able to get a good handle as to where it was in any given year. Jupiter's family, and Jupiter has captured about 400 comets, somewhere between the orbits of Mars that you see here, and the orbit of Jupiter. There are about, <clears throat> excuse me, 400 comets that have been held in orbits with periods of roughly six to 12 years. And SW3 is a card carrying member of this group. And so that's why it constantly got pulled back and forth uh, off course with its orbit. Again, it was a very small comet. We did see it again in 1990. And in 1995, when this comet was uh, passing the Earth and passing the Sun in the fall of 1995 in September, something very interesting happened to it. This comet, uh, SW3, Schwachmann Machmann 3, showed signs that it was releasing gas at an unusually high amount of rate. Uh, in fact, the uh, hydroxyl radical in this comet, uh, well, the production of that spiked uh, in uh, September. And then the comet started getting brighter. Now, the comet was very far from the Earth and wasn't expected to get much brighter than magnitude 12. And yet, and yet, uh, it started getting so bright uh, and, and much brighter than uh, the original anticipated uh, brightness that it started to surge so much so that they sent out a special circular from the uh, Smithsonian Observatory, the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams, uh, indicating that the Bureau received numerous reports from observers worldwide of independent discoveries of this comet, which has continued a remarkable outburst in brightness. Yes, how remarkable? Well, look at this. There you see the comet, and believe it or not, this was taken when the comet was 122 million miles away. Now, think about this. The comet came literally right up next to the Earth in 1930, and you still couldn't see it without good binoculars or a telescope. And here now, 25 times farther out in space, farther away from the Earth, the comet was visible to the unaided eye. In fact, it was about 400 times brighter than predictions had indicated. This uh, quote from a famous comet observer and a discoverer of comets in Australia, Terry Lovejoy, tells it all. He said it looked like a mini Halley. Its coma displayed a striking parabolic outline. Its tail was so intense, its first half degree, uh, that the ghostly glow was an evident even through horizon haze. Amazing. Here was a comet that was supposed to be very dim, which suddenly got very bright. And the answer to why it got very bright became evident in the weeks thereafter. It, uh, the nucleus or the coma of the comet became bloated. And in early December, look what happened. Not one, not two, but four separate pieces, four new nuclei. Well, one nuclei and three uh, separately new nuclei, the comet had broken or fragmented into four parts. And this is why the comet became so bright. A tremendous expulsion of dust, which followed in the wake of the comet's uh, fragmentation is what made the comet so very, very bright in the fall of 1995. In 2001, we, uh, you know, the comet came back and uh, it showed that it had still uh, 
had evidence of some of the fragments, some of the pieces from uh, 1995. You see three of them here. And the comet continued to fragment. In fact, in 2006, whatever was left of the comet was now going to be passing very close to the Earth, within about 7 million miles of the Earth in 2006. And in 2006, we decided, since it was coming very close, that we would use two of our best telescopes in space. The first one was the, of course, Hubble Space Telescope, which zoomed in on three of the fragments here, fragment R, fragment G, fragment B. We listed them in alphabetical order. But then look at what happened when we zoomed in with the Hubble on fragment B. It was just not a single fragment. There were many fragments, many pieces showing up uh, in this view here. That was just one single fragment. Uh, it was disintegrating right before our eyes. And then the Spitzer Space Telescope took a whack at it. This uh, took a, a view of the comet in the infrared spectrum. And you see the pieces here. Here's uh, one and two and three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, more pieces back here. Eventually there was something like 60 separate pieces or fragments that were in evidence uh, from both the Hubble and from the Spitzer Space Telescope. So the comet literally was breaking apart. Here you see the orbit of the comet as it rounds the sun in its five and a half year period around the sun. In this part out here near Jupiter, it's high above the plane of the solar system. And then as it sweeps on in toward the sun, it crosses or comes very close to crossing the orbit of our planet, the Earth. In fact, it comes so very, very close that some people thought that maybe, maybe we might actually see a meteor shower from the uh, passage of this comet every time it passes close to the Earth's orbit. In fact, this is not the first time that something like this had happened. There was a comet back in the 19th century, Comet Bela, which in 1843 apparently broke into not four, but two pieces. And the two pieces or the double comet was seen in 1846 and in 1852. And then when it was expected to return in 1858, no comet. What happened to Comet Bela? Everybody was wondering. They looked for it, but they couldn't find it. And it wasn't visible either in 1865. But in 1872, when the remnants or the supposed remnants of Comet Bela, the pulverized remnants of Comet Bela crossed the Earth's orbit and the Earth arrived at that particular crossing point in space, look at what was seen, a magnificent display of meteors, of shooting stars. And so a lot of people in the aftermath of the breakup of SW3, Comet SW3, were saying, is it possible that this comet too might give rise to a spectacular meteor display? Actually, when the comet was first discovered in 1930, just a few days after the comet was uh, discovered and when a preliminary orbit was made up, uh, one astronomer, a fellow by the name of Shibata in Japan, made the prediction that there might be a meteor shower sometime around the 9th or 10th of June. And indeed, we do have a report, a single report from a Japanese observer who said that there was a meteor shower and 60 to 70 meteors were seen during the night of the 9th and 10th of June in 1930. Well, that's interesting. Certainly a, a meteor shower like that or that magnitude was about the equivalent of, let's say the famous Perseid shower that everybody looks forward to in the month of August. But there's a problem with accepting that this actually happened. You see the same Japanese gentleman who claimed that he saw these meteors also said they were very, very faint and also said that on the night that he saw them, he saw them during a full moon night. And there was a halo around the moon indicating that there were high thin clouds in the sky. Now, for you to be able to see faint meteors with a bright moon and a halo effect indicating a high cloud cover, that kind of makes you wonder, did he actually see it or was he making it up? I will tell you this, this gentleman who claimed to have very sensitive eyes was the only person in the world who saw this meteor shower. Uh, many other people looked and saw nothing. Uh, even the uh, people in Great Britain, the British Meteor Society, they saw nothing and blamed the moonlight. And yet this one person claimed that he saw this meteor display. So it still is a question mark as to whether or not there really was a meteor shower associated with comet SW3 way back in 1930. 
Well, comets are cosmic litter bugs. They usually leave behind a trail of debris when they pass the sun. And this debris is not big. I mean, it's not like boulders and rocks. Instead, most of the debris that's shed are the size of pebbles or sand grains or fine dust. And so that usually is what happens when the Earth reaches the crossing point of a comet. Uh, when we run through that debris, uh, we see meteors shooting stars in the sky. Now, in 2005, uh, several uh, astronomers at the University of Western Ontario, uh, Paul Weigert, Peter G. Brown, uh, Helen Shins, they wrote a paper uh, suggesting that, uh, well, maybe it's possible that we could, have, could see a meteor shower from uh, this comet, SW3. And if it does occur, it would occur from the constellation of Hercules. That's why they called it the Tau Hercules meteor shower. But this gentleman right here, Jay Vaubalion, he's a very famous French observer, a meteor uh, shower expert. He has a special computer program in which he actually generates meteor information, or at least particles that come off of a comet that produce meteoroids that we possibly may intersect that causes a meteor shower. In using his simulator for this particular uh, comet, uh, Valbalion came up with this idea that looking into the future, no significant number of meteoroids released during the splitting of the comet SW3 in 1995 is expected to encounter the Earth in 20, oh, 2022. So according to the Frenchman, again, uh, Jeremy Valbalion, there's nothing to get excited about this year in 2022. The, uh, his uh, computer simulator showed that there would be no interaction between the meteors that, or the meteoroids that were produced in the aftermath of the fracturing of the comet nucleus in 1995 to cause a significant shower this year. Now, when I read that report, I became curious and uh, said to myself, well, you know, I've got a computer program at home that can uh, produce or replicate orbits of uh, comets. Why don't I create uh, my own comet trail? I'll get 20 comets. I'll put them together really close at the point where the comet in 1995, SW3, fractured into four parts. And then using the computer, I will move those pieces along. As time wears on, those pieces will stretch out and form a trail of meteoroids. And we'll see whether or not uh, Vaubalion's uh, prediction is true. And so here we go. Here is the orbit of Mercury and Venus. Here's the Earth. And there's the, the orbit of SW3. And there's the intersection point between the Earth and the comet. So now let's move things along and see how uh, and where uh, things are going to happen. Here comes the Earth rounding the sun in its orbit and approaching that intersection point right there. But where's the comet? There is no comet. There is no meteor trail. And so Valbalion was probably right. His computer program was right. There was nothing to for the Earth to intersect. And here comes the comet. And here comes its trail of meteors. But they are coming several months after the Earth reached the crossing point. So the comet was late in getting to the crossing point, And all of its meteoroids were late too. So that's the reason why, said Valbalion, we would not see anything this year in 2022. But I said, wait a minute, hold on. This is not the way comets, I mean, comets, when they go near the sun, they uh, warm up and they release uh, particles out into space. But this was not a typical situation. This was a comet that, as we noted, broke into several parts and fragmented and sent out into space in all directions debris, meteors, uh, meteor, meteoric material. And I said, well, maybe, just maybe, when the comet broke up, these particles just went out in all different directions at rather high speed. This is an important consideration. You see, we're not just talking about little particles of dust. We're talking about larger particles, particles of like large pebbles, or maybe even large nuggets, and this is an important consideration in our calculations. You see, when you take into account the orbit of a comet as it moves around the sun and how the nucleus rotates in such a way, you have jet reactions from 
uh, the material on the comet nucleus, but also we happen to have the material sent out into space at varying speeds. If the comet breaks into several parts, the amount of material that goes out into space is shot out in all directions at high speeds. And then we have a situation that, well, may set the stage for a meteor shower this coming month of May. You see, solar radiation, the pressure that pushes on objects out into space, Light does have pressure. When you hold your hand in front of a lamp, so to speak, or under a lamp, you don't feel that pressure, but there is pressure. The fact is that if an art particle is small enough, a little tiny piece of dust, for example, or something maybe the size of a sand grain, then what happens is that that material ends up getting blown or pushed back by solar radiation pressure and lags behind the comet. But if we have a case where there were larger pieces and particles, larger than sand grains, larger than dust, then the solar radiation pressure will have no effect on them. And another important fact, those larger pieces could end up not behind, but in front of the comet. And in fact, here you see the, uh, the comet as was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2006, that one particular fragment B, you see all those particles that are being shed. Well, how about considering that the um, material is not lagging behind, but in front of the comet. Would that play a role perhaps in helping us see a meteor display? Yes, yes, because if the comet has particles in front, uh, in front of it, then maybe it would reach that crossing point before the Earth. And look, it does, it does. Here is the Earth, here is the Earth. And it, look, between uh, sample 12 and 13 in the comet trail, that's what is occurring, and we're intersecting those particles, presumably on May 28th of this year. So there is a possibility that we might encounter meteoroids this coming May on the 28th, or maybe it might actually be uh, a different date or different time. I, I said that it uh, was intersecting the Earth between uh, two samples that I had created, sample number 12 and sample number 13. So then what I did was, I did another calculation using my computer program and created about 20 comets in that uh, narrow sector. There you see those comets here. And here you see the Earth. And look, look here, as they reach the crossing point right here, the Earth is intercepting at least four or five of those comets. And that seems to suggest that it would intercept at least a part of that cometary trail. So yes, there is very definitely a possibility of our uh, seeing a meteor shower. Again, assuming that this material is flowing or moving out ahead of the comet uh, in space. May 29.74 UT plus or minus 1.5 days. So sometime maybe on the 28th, the 29th, the 30th, the 31st, somewhere in that time frame, a, a meteor shower may very well happen. Again, based upon uh, the calculations that I did, uh, by doing the uh, check of the comet uh, orbit. I wrote a paper about this, uh, which uh, was uh, in a, uh, uh, an issue of the uh, Royal Ast Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And it asked the question, will comet 73P Schwachmann Wachmann 3 produce a meteor outburst? And I wrote that it could if the meteors are moving, if the uh, particles are moving at a high enough speed after being ejected out of the comet from the 1995 fragmentation and are positioned ahead of the comet out in space. Here is, are two other papers that were written, one by a German group uh, about uh, the possibility of uh, Schwachmann Wachmann 3 shedding uh, meteoroids, and another group in Japan uh, asking the same question and suggesting that yes, if the meteors are traveling, if the meteoroids are traveling out in front of the comet, we may very well see a meteor shower at the end of May of this year. They are working with much more sophisticated computer programs than I. And the interesting thing is, is that both groups came within four minutes of each other in their calculation of when the earth would intersect this area of meteoroids. They came up with May 31.206 UT, that is equal to May 31st, 
12.57 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So that is an important date to mark down. That is the time when the Earth is going to be encountering meteoric material shed by the comet back in 1995. So the thing that really gladdened my heart is this: what this gentleman said. This is our old friend from France, Jeremy Bovalion. If you remember, he had said originally using his comet uh, simulator that this would not happen. Back in 2005, his simulator showed that the comet material would not interact with the Earth. But after reading my paper, and then after reviewing everything, and then going back and using his uh, simulator and readjusting it, he came up with a different conclusion. He wrote in 2021, Joe Rayo published a study showing that if the meteoroids are ejected at higher velocity, they will definitely cause a meteor outburst. Rayo also explored the influence of the change of the comet's orbital elements. And then he did his own short study and confirmed what I had said, and also went slightly further exploring conditions that make a shower possible, as well as uh, optimization of going out, looking up and observing these meteors. So again, because the meteoroids were sent out in all directions and were of much larger size and were not uh, affected by solar radiation pressure. It now appears that we will indeed interact with material at the end of May, producing a never before seen meteor shower, or maybe we might even call it a meteor outburst. So now I'm sure those of you who are watching this right now are probably asking the question, all right, how much, how many meteors per hour might we see if we step outside at that time, May 31st at just around one o'clock in the morning, Eastern Daylight Time? Okay, let's, let's try and figure this out. Now, in 2017, the year 2017, we saw a batch of material that was shed by Comet SW3 from 1941 of all years, 1941 passed to within 102,300 miles of the Earth. A lot of astronomers and scientists said, no, it's too far away. We'll not see anything. But we did. We saw five meteors averaging per hour in 2017. Those who were watching, and also there was an automatic uh, photographic uh, observatory that picked up on these meteors. So we saw five per hour in 2017 from material that was shed back in 1941. Now, this year, in 2022, Look at this. This time, the Earth is going to be passing into the zone of meteoroids shed by 19, from 1995, the sweet spot, so to speak. In fact, we're going to be 35,500 miles from the center of that realm of meteoroid activity. And that's, that's almost, well, almost four times closer than we were in 2017 when we interacted with the stuff from 1941. So, if we saw five per hour in 19, um, in, in 2017, and we were uh, actually, we were about three times closer now in this year, 2022, we should see proportionally on a proportional scale, 14 meteors per hour this year at the end of May, 2022 on May 31st. 14 per hour is not a whole big deal. I mean, I, I you know, certainly I wouldn't go out to, you know, check this out because you know the, the, the meteors coming would be few and far between. But I point this out to you. This is the stuff that was shed in 1995. Now, back in 2017, when we saw five per hour, that was from just a few flakes, a few bits that came off of the comet. And remember, the comet was a small comet, didn't really shed all that much material. But now in 1995, when it broke into several pieces, a lot of dust suddenly shot forth out into space. The concentration of material is much, much thicker than it was back in 2022. The question is, how much thicker? Well, if we assume 14 per hour, based upon what we saw in 1941, if it was 14 per hour, and now we assume that the material in 1995 was 10 times more concentrated, well, that would suggest that we'd see meteors coming at the rate of 
140 an hour. That's pretty darn good. That means meteors would be flashing across the sky at the rate of about two per minute. That's a good outburst. That's, that's equivalent to one of the best meteor showers we see all year, the Geminid meteor shower of December. So a very, very good display coming up possibly uh, on May 31st. But now I wanna bring up a gentleman who many of you may know, maybe not personally or knew personally because he did pass away uh, many years ago, but he's still on television. You see him doing paintings. This is Bob Ross on the PBS show, Joy of Painting. And sometimes he, he creates masterpieces on his easel, on his, uh, on his uh, display board in a matter of minutes, uh, less than a half an hour's time. And during the show, if you ever watch Bob Ross with a soothing voice, sometimes about halfway through the show, he'll look at you and smile just like you're seeing there. And he'll say, let's get crazy. And then start doing things like filling the, filling the, uh, the painting with all kinds of trees or mountains or, or whatever. Well, now I say, let's get crazy. Instead of assuming that the amount of meteoroids were 10 times more or greater than we saw in 2017, maybe, maybe they were 100 times greater. If that be the case, then look at this. In this year of 2022, on May 31st, there's a chance we might see a heck of a lot of meteors. 14 per hour, 1,400 per hour. That's, that's 14 times 100. That's a full-fledged meteor storm. And it's quite possible that we just might see something like that at the end of May of this year. A meteor storm. We'd see meteors coming at the rate of 15, 20, 25 meteors per minute. That would be really something to see. That would be something great to see in the sky. Well, there are a couple of drawbacks to this. Uh, you see here two meteor showers. We see the Leonid meteors in November. That's a shower that everybody... Uh, looks for in November, and when they do occur, and when they are seen, the meteors are usually very bright. They're bright because, look at this, the meteoroids are moving in the opposite direction to the Earth. The Earth is moving in its orbit this way from left to right, but the Leonids are moving from right to left and slamming into the Earth at 72 kilometers a second. That's why when they flare through our atmosphere, they appear very bright, and they leave behind bright incandescent trails. But the SW3 meteors are moving much slower. They're moving in the same direction as the Earth, and only those meteoroids that could come close to the Earth and actually enter the Earth's atmosphere will be seen. But they're moving only about one quarter as fast as the Leonids, and so they're moving much slower. And also, if they're moving slower, they also are probably going to be quite a bit fainter. You know, it's possible that we might see 1,400 per hour, but about 90% of them might be very, very faint. In fact, when we had the Belid meteors, the meteors that were shed by that comet that broke into two back in the 19th century, Comet Bela, when people looked into the sky that night and saw all those meteors, they described them as slow, faint, and evanescent. Evanescent is a word which means they, they came and they went very quickly. They were very, uh, uh, they, they were only there for a moment before they faded out from view. Although uh, a comparable number of those meteors were also described as first magnitude. That means as bright as the brightest stars and often appearing red with trains of orange sparks. So maybe if the Beelid shower of 1872 was spectacular, the one we may see at the end of May of this year might also be similarly bright and spectacular to a degree as well. In fact, uh, back uh, several years ago, one gentleman in Canada, Pierre Martin, who was looking around, saw uh, a meteor from the SW3 uh, swarm. This was uh, not from the 1995 display, but one from uh, some years back, uh, many, many years earlier. And he said that it was very bright and it left a wide trail or a wake that hung in the sky for a while. So maybe, just maybe, we might see a number of these kind of meteors again at the end of May of this year. We'll have to wait and see. The meteors would come. Now, it was originally surmised that they would come from Hercules. If you remember, that's why they were called the Tower Hercules. But then this new shower, this one coming based upon the material that broke up from the fracturing of the comet nucleus in 1995 would not be coming from Hercules. It'd be coming from another constellation, Buotes, the herdsman. And this is a constellation 
not far from the uh, vicinity of the Big Dipper. We'll talk about that in a moment. This shows you, this map shows you the number of degrees in the sky that the radiation point, the emanation point from where the meteors are coming from, how high in the sky would be. Now, if you were in Baja, California, actually it's a part of Mexico, that emanation point would be directly overhead. Very, very nice. Here in the New York area, though, we're not going to see it overhead. We're going to see it somewhere between 60 and 50 degrees high, 55 degrees high. How high is 55 degrees, you may ask? Well, if you make a clenched fist and hold the fist out as far as you can on your outstretched arm and then put the bottom of your fist on the horizon, the top part of your fist, it would be 10 degrees. So you see this gal over here, this girl right here, she's using her fist. This would be from the bottom of the horizon, from the horizon to the top of the horizon, that's 10 degrees. That's one fist, two fists, three fists, four fists. And here's this young man over here looking skyward at 55 degrees up. That's five and a half fists above the horizon. That's more than halfway up in the sky. So you certainly will have a good view, a good uh, perspective of where those meteors are going to be coming from on a star map. Here you see how the skies will be at one o'clock in the morning on May 31st when that meteor shower is anticipated and will come to its peak. As I said, Bowotis is not too far away from the Big Dipper. You, of course, use the handle of the Big Dipper. Follow the arc of the handle to this bright star, yellowish orange Arcturus, one of the brightest stars in the sky. And all you need to do is to look for Arcturus on the night of the shower. And the radiation or emanation point, the apparent source of the meteors, will be not too far away from Arcturus. And they'll seem to streak out in all directions from that emanation point in the sky. And like I said, if we have a big outburst or even a meteor storm, you'll see a lot of these flying off in all directions, again, from near that bright star Arcturus on the night of May 31st, the morning, actually, of May 31st at 1 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Best part of all is there's not going to be any moonlight. The moon sometimes is very bright near full phase and uh, blots out the sky with its light. But the moon is going to be near new phase. No moonlight. Get away from any bright lights. Get away from any bright city lights into an area where it's nice and dark and where you can see a lot of meteors. Well, hopefully nature will put on a show for you, all of us that night. Now, I have to tell you, here's the disclaimer. The meteors might be very faint so faint you might even not be able to see them with the eye. Or we may not hit the uh, realm of the meteor activity just in the way that we would like, and we wouldn't see anything in the sky. That's a possibility, but let's hope that that's not the case. But we have had cases in the past where we were surprised by meteor events like this. In 1803, April of 1803, there was a meteor shower so intense that it surprised so many people that they actually rang the church bell at one o'clock in the morning to wake everybody up and head outside. And people actually thought the world was coming to an end because there were so many meteors flaring down in the heavens. And there was, of course, the shower we just mentioned, the Beelid shower in 1872. We may see a shower like that perhaps at the end of May of this year, or maybe a meteor shower like we saw in 1933. This one was called the Jacobinids because it came from or was uh, shed by the comet Jacobini Zinner. Uh, and they appeared to flare out or flame out from the head of the constellation of Draco the Dragon. There you see down here, the Big Dipper once again. So what will we see? What can we hope to see? Well, hopefully we'll see a lot. Uh, and I'm going to be out there that night. And I certainly hope all of you will be out there. Again, May 31st. 1 a.m., that is the projected time or peak of the meteors. And let's hope again that we get to see a really spectacular display on that night. So I want to thank you for listening. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hope that we will see a wonderful meteor display uh, on that night. And I want to thank all of you for uh, coming to this recording of this uh, event, uh, this uh, recording of this uh, lecture that I was going to give at uh, NEF had we had it in person. But for those of you who are here watching right now, thank you very, very much. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed it and learned a little something about this prospective meteor display. If you have a chance to uh, read my article in the May issue of Sky and Telescope, 
Everything I just mentioned is in that article and that you in preparing for this meteor shower. So again, thank you very much and uh, we'll see you real soon. Thank you. Rockland Astronomy hopes you have enjoyed this program.